Um, well, what can I say? It's really a great pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I'm changing the trend to, to, to speak in English, um, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as a surgical topic, it's going to be very pragmatic. It's going to be practical. Uh, the institution that I work at is the Royal Marsden, which is a national cancer center in London. We treat uh, 900 to 1,000 new cancers per year. There are five uh, oncoplastic surgeons, five plastic surgeons, uh, three medical oncologists, three radiation oncologists. So we're, we're a big unit. Uh, so the talk today is going to be about uh, the effect of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the surgeon's viewpoint. Sorry. Am I, do I have control over this? Okay, thank you. So, there are many reasons for doing primary chemotherapy. For the surgeon, the main aim is to downsize the tumor. This historically has been mastectomies to allow breast conservation, but more and more we are seeing breast conservation already applicable to the um, f diagnosis, and it makes breast conservation easier, so maybe converting from oncoplastics to standard breast conservation surgery, or making breast conservation an even lesser amount of volume resection. Clearly for the medical oncologist, there are other issues. The chemosensitivity is an absolute measure, the aim is the in vivo monitoring of response and avoiding the toxicity of drugs that don't work. And ultimately, what we are seeing for the patient is a reduction of tumor burden. And so over the years, we have seen an improvement with imp uh, uh, better chemotherapy and with biological treatments. And so this is a simplistic version of showing how these changes have improved over the last 25 years with the pre-anthrocycline era showing the lowest rates of uh, complete pathological responses through the anthrocycline era, increasing those rates through the taxanes in the early 2000s, and now with biological therapies and identification of subgroups that might do better with um, primary chemotherapy. So historically, this is the kind of patient that we were looking at, patients who would otherwise need a mastectomy and being able to downsize that tumor. The holy grail, of course, is to get a complete response, but there are some times when you have no response and all, everything in between. These responses can be difficult to monitor. The type 1 response is the best in the sense that you can get a tumor which is the size of an apple that becomes then the size of an olive, and being able to treat that olive becomes a much simpler procedure for the surgeon. But then you get this type of fragmentation responses, type 2 patchy responses, which can be difficult to trace. And the smaller the, the kind of microscopic foci, the more difficult it is for the, uh, the uh, radiology to, to be able to identify accurately what the, the true response is until surgery has been done. So there was a time when surgeons used to excise the entire footprint that was the footprint at presentation. But more and more, we're now able to do less surgery based on the surgical response. So taking that one step further, if there's no response, we would do the same operation in terms of removing the footprint. If you have this type of response and you can predict it beforehand, then we would resect that same footprint. But ideally, if you get a good response, then you can do a smaller resection. And if you've got a complete pathological response, then it's just the targeted representative section. So looked another way, it's uh, shown graphically here, if you have a uh, horizontal axis that represents the level of response. You can see that if these two arrows on the same uh, v uh, horizontal axis uh, shows the extent of response, as in this example here, you're still needing a mastectomy, but in this example, you might be able to downsize a response which is affecting two quadrants to one quadrant and therefore allowing an oncoplastic procedure. And then the final example here, you patient was suitable for breast conservation anyway. Uh, we use marker clips, to, uh, which I'll come back to, and most of these situations where you've got a complete response, we just excise the marker clip. Looking at lists, which of these indications for mastectomies could be downsized by primary chemotherapy? We are still, in my view, limited to this. Large tumor size in relation to the breast, downsizing that 
avoiding a mastectomy because we are able to uh, reduce the tumour to allow a safe resection with clear margins. Multicentric disease with tumour in opposite quadrants or different sectors uh, of the breast is still a problem. We don't have a good enough tool to be able to uh, reduce uh, the resp uh, to, to, to uh, down downgrade the uh, tumour so to avoid a mastectomy altogether. Local recurrences are in the same category. Even though if you get a very good response, the patient's had radiotherapy before, and you're still heading for a mastectomy uh, either way. For most of these locally advanced disease and inflammatory disease, whether it, when it's involving the skin and the chest wall, that's a T4, A, B, and C, and the inflammatory is T4, D, we end up doing a mastectomy anyway. So really what I'm going to focus on is, in this, is this group here today. There are other implications to the surgeon. It might make the oncologic part of the surgery easier. For example, a, 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 a stuck axilla could become a much easier axillary uh, dissection. It's possible that we might, that we might have lower re uh, recur recurrence rates by um, eradication of the micrometastatic disease. Uh, there are some theories of stimulatory effects of surgery and primary chemotherapy might help mitigate that. Um, and there are possible disadvantages. One of those is uh, patients who may have had quite a difficult time with chemotherapy and then having major surgery, especially if reconstructions are considered. And then uh, for us, importantly, the small win or smaller window between surgery and radiotherapy, especially with some implant-based surgical techniques, being able to utilize that time uh, between surgery and radiotherapy before the radiotherapy is given could be quite important. So if we look at some data, recently the uh, early breast cancer trialist group compared the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting in terms of uh, individualizing patient data and what type of surgery those patients received. And it also uh, went on to give us some good information about local recurrence rates and whether or not this made any difference to overall survival. So ultimately, 10 studies were identified consisting of over 4,500 women with a follow-up of nearly nine years I draw your attention to this, however. Even though this is a relatively recent study, there was only one paper that looked at anthracyclines and taxanes, and only 82% of their studies included an anthracycline. But nevertheless, this is the closest we've got to modern information of, of primary chemotherapy and, the, and how it affects the surgeon. So if we look at the bottom two rows first, what we're seeing here is that if we look at all women, a lot of patients are receiving primary chemotherapy when they're suitable for breast conservation anyway. That's at 83% here. What we can also take away from this is the better the response, the more we're likely to be able to avoid a mastectomy. So in that, in that last row, the numbers of mastectomies go up with worsening response rates. And if you look at patients who have a planned mastectomy, and then you look at what kind of surgery they've had, if a complete response is achieved, we're doing breast conservation in 60% of those. And as the uh, response becomes worse, progressing to the right of the slide, or your, your right of the slide, uh, the uh, breast conservation rates fall. Another way of looking at this data is dividing it into the allocated treatments. So the darker bars represent allocated to neoadjuvant, and the lighter bars allocated to adjuvant. And the individualized patient data allowed similar groups to be uh, compared. So that's these uh, three histograms here showing the intent to treat being similar until the neoadjuvant chemotherapy effect was taken into account. And you can see that with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the darker bars breast conservation was much more likely uh, than uh, if you had no uh, primary chemotherapy. So we accept that primary chemotherapy can downsize significantly, can achieve suitable breast conservation, and you can treat on the basis of reducing the size of the footprint, not necessarily having to reject the entire footprint. However, there comes a cost of this, and that is in local recurrence. So we tell all our patients that the local recurrence risks are higher after primary chemotherapy, but this local recurrence risk being higher does not impact on survival. Right? So you can look at this in both ways. There is a high recurrence risk, and that's a, uh, that's a bad thing, but there are a greater number of people who can, and who can be spared a mastectomy, and, there is no, and this does not reflect negatively on the breast cancer survival or overall survival. Looking at the breast cancer, uh, sorry, the local recurrence rates a bit closer, 
uh, you can see that the bars rep are uh, five or six percent. It's an acceptable number in terms of local re recurrence uh, numbers. So it increases the typical uh, local recurrence uh, figure of five percent to something like ten percent. The, the majority of these recurrence rates will happen in the first four years. Uh, and again, that will reflect two things. One, the tumor biology that we're dealing with. Uh, and secondly, that there is a limitation of breast conservation in this group. Uh, and that this has to be weighed up against also obtaining the information that a good result or a good uh, pathological response bears with itself a uh, pro prognostic indicator that's favorable for that patient. So with subgroups identified to do better, these being the triple negative group, and in this slide, the uh, HER2 positive groups, you can see that the response rates uh, with a combination of trastuzumab and pertuzumab is now uh, perhaps the, the best that we can achieve in primary chemotherapy. But again, there is no survival difference. So if path CR rates are improving, can we select patients who do not need surgery after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So in the past session, there was, some, uh, there was some discussion or presentations about imaging. There are some limitations to overall accuracy, and I'll come back to this, because this is the only thing that we as surgeons can perhaps uh, influence at this point in time. We have looked at the biological markers. If the triple negative groups respond favorably. The HER2 positives are the better uh, subgroups that uh, can get better path responses. I hope that in the future, biological markers which are superior can uh, predict for better responses and which groups may not need surgery, but we do not have that information yet. And similarly, we are still undivided, uh, we are still divided, I should say, about what radiotherapy regimens are optimum after uh, primary chemotherapy. An example of this would be a complete pathological response in the breast, complete pathological response in the axilla, and the patient may only have had a targeted axillary dissection and not a full treatment of the axilla, what radiotherapy fields do we treat? Do we just treat the breast, or do we also have to treat uh, the other radiotherapy fields that we would have otherwise done if we had treated her up front, including the supraclavicular fossa and the internal memory chain? So in my institution, the idea of not doing surgery goes back quite a long way. Uh, my colleague Paul Ellis looked at this uh, in 1998. The response rates with, in the main, non-anthracycline-based chemotherapies then were much lower, with a, a complete, clinical uh, clinic, complete clinical response ris rate of 39 over 185 patients. And of those 39, there was an opportunistic study to compare that against 120 patients who had a response. One group had, local regional, uh, one group had surgery, and the other group had radiotherapy only. Already, we were seeing that the local recurrence rates were higher in the surgery and radiotherapy group. Uh, this would be compared to a typical uh, local recurrence risk at that time of about 3%, but there was a much higher risk with, of, of recurrence if you did not do any surgery. So Alistair Ring looked at this a bit further in an in a anthracycline era, uh, response risk, uh, rates 136 out of 453, randomized into surgery or no surgery, uh, sorry, randomized into surgery or no surgery, and, you, and once again, you can see that higher local recurrence risks as shown in the more, uh, more recent studies. But again, the no, radio, the no surgery group, radio, direct radiotherapy had a much higher local recurrence risk, one in five recurrence. And these were unacceptable, and the program went to sleep for quite a while. So the, returning to the imaging, uh, we have seen, uh, I'm only going to present uh, mammography, ultrasound, and MRI, which is what we are currently using. But we can see in these studies, ranging from 2005 to pretty much current day, that the negative predictive value and the false negative rates of all of these are quite significant. Even if you take out the um, outlier studies like that one by Croshaw, you can see that the false negative rate of mammography is up to 15%, for ultrasound up to 25%, and with MRI in the main better, but some studies still showing quite significant false negative rates in assessing primary chemotherapy from the eyes of the surgeon in predicting the operation. So this is what we do at the Marsden. I'm, I, don't, I think that it's helpful for me to present to you what we do, I'm not saying that necessarily that it's right. Uh, it has been evolving over the years, and what's happened to, these, um, uh, to this protocol is that it's become part of the, uh, uh, part of the regional network um, uh, and how we manage patients with primary chemotherapy. So if we have somebody having primary chemotherapy, everybody has a pretreatment mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. A marker clip is placed at the time of the 
primary diagnosis, and usually this is done at the time of the first call. If there is microcalcification uh, that is biopsied and found to be positive, we return and place a marker in these areas, and all positive nodes receive a marker clip too. We use ultrasound to monitor the response, and post-chemotherapy, we repeat the mammogram, the ultrasound, and the MRI. So from a surgeon's perspective, the categoric outcomes are quite clear. There may be no response, we do the same surgery. There may be partial response. If it's palpable, they just have a wide excision. If it's impalpable, they have a wide localization. If they needed a mastectomy because uh, of the presentation and the response is partial and they are not suitable for anything else, they still have a mastectomy. If they have a complete imaging response, we, put a, uh, we wire the coil and take it out. And this, this approach of just taking the marker coil out is not an alien one. It's something that the Breast International Group has, has endorsed for quite some time. So what happens to the pathology? So in those partial responses that have breast conservation, up to 30% of them need more surgery for incomplete margins or unpredictable disease that was not uh, identified on the uh, imaging. So we have to tell these patients that if you do this, there is a 30% chance that you have uh, a second operation. This is against a 5 to 10% chance of somebody who's not having primary chemotherapy. If you have had a complete response and, there's a 50, uh, and then you've just excised the marker clip, there's an up to 15% chance in our hands that they would need further surgery. Okay? And this is usually because of unpredictable disease that's been left over. So here are some examples. This is a lady who's had a mammogram showing quite extensive disease in the right upper outer quadrant. Um, it's, although it might be one great palpable mass on, on imaging, you can see that it's comp composed of uh, multiple smaller nodules, but nevertheless it all involves one segment of the breast. Post chemotherapy, she's had quite a good result. You can see the marker coils there and there where we have taken and proven that these in were involved with tumor. There's some leftover disease there with some microcalcification. So we wire all that and remove it. And you can see your, the, the clips. So there's one marker clip there and there's one marker clip uh, somewhere else there. Uh, then we orientate the specimen. That's the uh, liger clips, which are telling us the, the orientation of the superior and lateral pole of the resection. So whilst for the clinician handling the tumor, it might be quite misleading that there's some residual disease because this fibrous thing here all turned out to be scar. So this lady had a complete pathological response. Here's another lady who had pretreatment imaging, and this is her MRI scan showing disease, which is quite extensive. Had, mul uh, had multiple biopsies confirming the footprint, but also had microcalcification. So you can biopsy the microcalcification up front, or you can biopsy the microcalcification subsequently. This was the microcalcification that she had. In this lady, because she was a transfer of care, we didn't biopsy the microcalcification at diagnosis. We would have done if we, if we had picked her up from the beginning, but because we picked her up halfway through treatment, we didn't biopsy it till the end. Nevertheless, she has had. Uh, 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 extensive vacuum biopsies showing the microcalcification, showing no cancer, and went on to have a wire localized excision using a single wire. The second wire is for the axilla. That's a narrow localized excision, again showing a complete response. This is another example where there was two disease, there are two sites, so multifocal but not multicentric, all in one sector, something that can be resected by an oncoplastic resection. So both sites were biopsied, both sites were marked, complete pathological and co sorry, complete imaging and complete clinical response, both sites marked. That was her pre-surgery and her post-surgery three years later, complete pathological response, and she remains well with her mammogram from last year shown. So coming back to the initial theme, is it possible that we might be able to improve things now in 2018 of no surgery? So we are now exploring the possibility of vacuum biopsies of patients who demonstrate a complete pathological response to see whether this can help predict for path response and then looking at whether we might be able to limit the surgery. So the first step of that would be to um, do the vacuum of the of the marker clip, put a new marker clip, remove it and see what the response are. And that's work in progress and so we're about to start a trial looking at this.
There are other existing trials already. Uh, these various trials are run by the Netherlands group, uh, group, in, uh, group from the uh, NRG, so that's the new NSABP. Uh, Heidelberg is another group, and I think CRUK is running Nostra. So there are other trials that will probably give us this information. The other topical area for us as surgeons is the axilla. Um, if we look at the, of the, the Bowie study, which was the ACOSOG Z1071 study in America, they had all comers, and they were able to show that the path response rates in the axilla was about 40%. If you take a very favorable subgroup, the triple negatives and the HER2 positives, you can see that the response rate in the axilla is considerably higher. So it's not that unusual. You've seen that in the breast, and now we're seeing this in the axilla too. So if we're accepting the concept that we're going to do less surgery in the breast, can we extend that concept to do less surgery in the axilla? So in San Antonio this year, there was a poster that surveyed surgeons saying, would you be willing to do less surgery in the axilla? And there were many surgeons who said in concept, yes, but this was not really substantiated when you look at those same surgeons' practice because there is a level of unacceptability from the kind of tuber boards and the multidisciplinary teams as to whether this was acceptable for their patients or not. And I guess patients also vote with their feet. Nevertheless, we're not really seeing that this is happening in, pro in, in reality, but there are some studies uh, that may well provide information that would allow us to look at this. So whilst we're in limbo, what are we doing at the Marsden? For all our patients who have positive axillary nodes, the largest node or any node that is biopsied has a clip placed. If there is no measurable response in the axilla after, radio, after chemotherapy, they all have an axillary dissection. If there's a partial response, they still have an axillary dissection. It's only if they have a complete clinical response and imaging response. Currently what we do is we wire the uh, marker coil and we also do a sentinel node, so we have a radioisotope as well. And we send both off intraoperatively, and they are measured. If there's micrometastasis, so this is at variance with what we would do in a situation where we are doing uh, upfront surgery, even if there's micrometastasis, they have an axillary dissection. But if there's no disease, then we do a targeted axillary dissection. It must contain at least four nodes, and we wait for the pathology. What radiotherapy we give those patients remains a source of great debate. I guess if they're having breast conservation surgery and they're going to need radiotherapy anyway, then radiotherapy is an option. If they're having a mastectomy and they're having radiotherapy anyway, radiotherapy is still an option. But where we have still lots of ambiguity is when we decide that radiotherapy may not be necessary after a mastectomy or a situation where the patient has had less than four nodes taken, and we don't really know what else is still going on in that axilla. We don't really have an answer to that. We argue about it every week. What I can give you data on, however, is wh what happens to that sentinel node in terms of is the wire more accurate or is the isotope more accurate? Because the concept here is if the, needled no or if the marked node is the positive node, and the lymphatic drainage is disrupted, then it is very possible then that the sentinel node that you take is not the, uh, the hot node. So situations where the hot node is the wired node, we find in 40%, where the hot node is not the wired node in 35%, there is a significant failure to localize. Either you can't see the coil, or th the coil is not in a node, or it is um, a technical failure because the isotope doesn't get to the destination. So this is really more an audit of process. We don't really have an audit of outcome right now. So in practice, what we do is we mark these nodes uh, on ultrasound. Uh, a useful dimension is knowing how deep it is to the skin. Uh, so this is a mammogram that I showed before, so that marks the uh, primary tumor, but this marks the lymph, the lymph node. We then remove that, and you can see here there's more than one lymph node that has been localized, even though the marker coil is in one, and, uh, in one of the two nodes, and this is very good for the pathologist to be able to see which is the node that you're really interested in. So, in conclusion, I think that primary chemotherapy is an excellent tool to increase the number of cases suitable for breast conservation, 
and to improve breast conservation options in patients who are already suitable for breast conservation. We have to accept that there's a slightly higher local recurrence rate, but there doesn't seem to be a negative impact on survival. We use marker coils extensively. It helps to guide surgery to the breast and axilla. And the future directions that we would like to see improvements are is not only in the interventional radiology, but also in biological markers and radiotherapy schedules. Thank you for your attention.